Okay, let's open our Bibles, if you will. The first Corinthians chapter 15 today, the mystery of the church and uh, the rapture. The mystery of the church and the rapture. Father, bless us as we open thy word together. Speak to us in this moment that we may draw close to thee. Fill us with thy spirit and send us forth, Lord, to be more than conquerors because of Jesus. In his name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a marvelous passage because it tells us of the glory of the resurrection. It is an entire systematic argument for the resurrection of the dead, for Christ's resurrection, and for the truth that one day we shall be raised incorruptible even as he was. Verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam brought physical death to all mankind. Jesus Christ in the resurrection of the just and the unjust will make all mankind alive once more. Notice verse 23. Every man in his own order. There is an order to this. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. It is, I believe, one of the great and enduring truths of Scripture that not only are we to rise from the dead, but God calls this resurrection a mystery. He discusses the glory of the terrestrial, the glory of the celestial, talks about the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars, and then he likens this to the resurrection, verse 42. So also in the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Scripture also says, verse 49, As we are born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Flesh and blood, verse 50, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because flesh and blood is a description of a mortal body which from the moment of its entrance into the world is in the process of dying. So flesh and blood is a symbol of corruption. It cannot inherit the kingdom of God because of its corruptibility. But in the resurrection there is a change. The corruption puts on incorruption. The mortal puts on immortality. Death is swallowed up by life. And so the Christian is never complete as God intended him to be until Jesus Christ returns to earth and fuses our spirits or souls with an immortal body which is to be resurrected from the grave. The resurrection will be in the twinkling of an eye. I've seen pictures that allegedly depict the resurrection of mankind. And you see people coming out of the graves and sailing upwards to heaven. Look, get all that nonsense out of your head. Because the scripture says when the Lord Jesus returns, he will come, number one, as a thief in the night. Now a thief does not blow the trumpet in advance and say, I'm coming this evening, be sure and be home, toot, 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 toot. We could kill a whole burglar rate in the state of California. All we'd have to do is have the burglars announce themselves. Then we could be ready. Although with our police efficiency in California, I'm not altogether sure that we'd be ready even then. But at any rate, the fact still remains that the coming of Christ is going to be, number one, a very quick thing. We are told it will take place in the twinkling of an eye. Now that's a beautiful expression because your eye is twinkling right now. It is moving up and down 
And that's what the biblical reference is to, the blinking of the eye. You will blink your way to the judgment seat of Christ. How's that for a fast trip? That's exactly what's going to happen. The Lord Jesus, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, all going to be in the twinkling of an eye. And the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain till the coming of the Lord shall be snatched, that's the Greek word, to snatch something. Perhaps I can illustrate it this way. How many times have you seen young men attempting to display the reaction time of their senses, reaching out for flies as they pass by? Have you seen anybody do that? I do it myself all the time. I keep lying to myself that I'm not getting any older. And so when a fly goes by, I just grab him. Ah, the old reflexes are just as good. Sometimes when I open my hand, they're not there. At that moment that I recognize the fact that the living know they must die. No matter how good a shape we try and keep ourselves in. Well, that's the meaning of the word. When the Lord Jesus descends from heaven, that's where the church will go. Faster than any human reflex can mark it. And you will instantly be in his presence. Now, the second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church. And it's described as a mystery. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the blinking of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. I want you to notice this. The speed of it. Verse 52. In a moment. The batting of an eye. The last trump, so there will be speed. Secondly, there will be sound. The world will know something happened. Now, of course, there's a lot of people saying, well, bumper sticker on the back of a car reflects the thought. Well, you know, Jesus is coming, and the driver will disappear at the rapture. And you see people talking about, everything's going to stop, Christians are all going to go. And cars are going to fly off the roads and planes are going to crash and all kinds of things. God never said anything about that. You are just extrapolating from the event what you think is going to happen. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says God will be in control of everything in heaven and on earth when that happens. So don't worry about your car smashing into somebody on the freeway or bumping your head on the way up. We shall all be changed. The corruption will put on incorruption. No more satchels under the eyes. No more protruding anteriors or posteriors. No more flat feet. No more glazed eye. No more deaf ear. No more crippled body. No more the marks and deformity of the curse of sin upon our race. In an instant infinite power will transfuse from heaven to earth and in the twinkling of an eye you will be made in the image of the Son of God and you will enter his presence there to answer and to praise and to receive the glory and the love of God as we have never known it before scripture again reiterates it let's not forget it Verse 51, it's a mystery. It's a sacred secret. God is not telling anybody when. He's not telling anybody how. 
He's only telling you why. And the why is Jesus Christ will come again. John chapter 14. And I, since I go away, will come again. And I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the promise. He will descend. Now people say, oh, but you know, the Christian church has been talking about the second coming of Christ and the great mystery of his appearance and everything. And it's the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the Lord Jesus and everything. But you know, actually it's been quite a long time. Uh, we've been waiting for quite a while. I mean, the book of Revelation says, surely I come quickly. This is not too quickly. 1900 years. And then again, you know, in our secret moments we say to ourselves, well, you know, I, I do believe in the Lord, I do believe in Christ, I do believe in the Scriptures, but you know, the idea of, of actually not dying at all is very intriguing but extremely remote, since all the evidence about me suggests that the death rate is still one per person. And what difference does it make anyhow? Jesus is going to come back again, but who cares about the details? The only important thing is we're going to be with him. Oh, how we rob ourselves when we think that way. How we rob ourselves of joy. Because, you know, the God who can suspend a billion galaxies, who can hold the stars in space by command, who can undergird the entire structure of energy and creation, by simply a command of his energy is not going to have a bit of trouble with your carcass or mine or anybody else's. It took us nine months to develop in the wombs of our mothers. We shall be born to immortality in the twinkling of an eye. A new creation. The old things will indeed pass away and everything will be new. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how this is going to take place in terms of what we're going to look like. Some people say, how will I look in the resurrection? Quit while you're ahead. Paul says it's a foolish question to ask God what you're going to look like in the resurrection. When you plant a seed in the ground, does it look like what comes up? Of course not. Well, he says, we're going to plant you in corruption and we're going to raise you in incorruption. We're going to plant you in mortality. We're going to raise you in immortality. We're going to plant you in death. We're going to raise you in immortal life. The heritage of the church, the great mystery of her union with Christ, is here stretched out for us in the panorama of Scripture. I show you. Oh, I love those words, verse 15. I show you. Isn't that nice? God showing us. I'm showing you a sacred secret something never before told you what is it we will not all die we shall all be changed the mortal to immortality the corruption to incorruptibility so this mystery is accompanied with speed the Lord Jesus will descend with the twinkling of an eye with sound the trump of God and the voice of the archangel. With movement, for the dead will be raised, incorruptible. And with change, the mortal will put on immortality. So, verse 54, a verse most Christians don't read too thoroughly. When the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, when the mortal shall have put on immortality, then, circle that in your Bible, will you? Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. When are we going to be able to say that death is swallowed up in victory? At the resurrection. Not now. When you die, your body is empirical proof scientific evidence beyond refutation that sin and Satan and death have been victorious over your body. You are Adam's child by generation and you are Christ's child by regeneration. 
In Adam, we all die spiritually, and with the exception of those who are alive when Christ returns, physically. But when the resurrection takes place, it's part of the mystery. When the resurrection takes place, the corruptible will have put on incorruptibility. So the body will be fashioned in the image of the Savior. First John chapter 3, we're told, it doth not yet appear what we shall be like, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he really is. That means we're going to have a body like unto his own glorious body. Through that power whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. He shall change these bodies of our humiliation. They humiliate us because of age. They humiliate us because of appearance. They humiliate us because of the lack of function. He will take away the humiliation of these bodies and make us like unto his own glorious body. Without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. Like a virgin bride to stand in his presence undefiled, just as righteous as God himself. That is the destiny of the mystery of the church. The marvel of the second coming. For the two are indissolubly linked. Notice in verse 54. Only after the resurrection shall the saying be brought to pass, death is swallowed up in victory. Only after the resurrection can we shout, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The grave has its victory now because our bodies are placed in it. But in Jesus Christ, God has given us glory immortality, eternal life. And there's a difference between eternal life and immortality, and I want you to notice it. Two different words. Eternal life is a gift of God bestowed upon you the moment you are regenerated. And you go on in fellowship with God forever. First John chapter 5. This is life eternal. What is it? To know Jesus Christ, John 17, to know the Father and to have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, forever. That is eternal life. Fellowship with the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus. What is immortality? Immortality is something you don't get until the resurrection. It refers to your body. And God's going to give you a glorious body like Christ. But you will not be complete until you are in his image spiritually redeemed and physically redeemed now some people get uptight and they say oh but the soul is immortal that is a misuse of the term the word immortal is never applied to your soul never it's always applied to your body and to the nature of God but never to the soul or the spirit your soul or your spirit is eternal by creation in Jesus Christ. But there's a big difference between fellowship with God and just having a redeemed body. Also, don't make the mistake that a lot of cults do and equate eternal life with endless being. Satan has endless being. Demons have endless being. Notice that we have been created in God's image. We will go on forever from the moment of creation. But endless being is not eternal life. Eternal life is for the church, which is Christ's body. Endless being is for the unregenerate man, Satan, and his demons. Complete difference. Satan will live forever, but... Satan will not have fellowship with God. He will be under punishment through all eternity. In fact, the Bible uses a very graphic picture. It says, the smoke of a torment ascends up to the throne of God into the endless ages of eternity. And oh, how people don't want to preach that today. 
Oh, how they want to talk about how Jesus died for our sins and how much God loves us, but they don't want to talk about how much it cost God to do that. They don't want to talk about eternal punishment because that offends people. The words of Admiral Dewey, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. It's about time we started offending the world because the world's not going to listen to us anyhow apart from Jesus Christ's spirit. But don't worry what the world has to say simply because it's never made any difference to God what they had to say. The only thing that makes a difference is what God has to say. Who are you going to answer to? God or the Kiwanis Club? God and the Rotary. God of the Masons. God of the Shriners. God of the Odd Fellows. God of this. God of that. Are you going to have to answer for that? No. You're going to answer to Jesus Christ personally. And the question is going to be asked you. What did you do with the gospel? Well, I preached it. And did you tell people everything? Well, I told them what was necessary. What was necessary? Well, I told them how you loved them, how you died for them, how you rose again, all that. Did you tell them they were lost? Well, I, I thought that might offend them, Lord. Very difficult for me to tell people they're lost. Why, well, they might have said to me, what makes you think you're saved? And then, of course, I would have been terribly embarrassed. Oh, poor soul. Imagine that. You're going to get hurt by the world. It's going to shut your mouth so you don't talk for Jesus. You know, that happens to Christians all the time. The world comes back at them and the Christian gets frightened. Do you tell me what in the world you have to be frightened about? If God be for us, who can stand against us? If the Lord be God, worship Him, serve Him. Who cares what people say or the world thinks? Those are status symbols that Christians hang on to. And God is not impressed with status symbols. God is impressed with the only symbol that makes any difference. The cross. And whether or not you've been there. And if you've been there, are you a silent witness? One of those lovely, quiet, sweet, ethical, moral people who show people Jesus in their lives by the way they live. They would never think of saying anything to offend anybody. Their life is their testimony. Are you one of those silent witnesses? If you are, make a mention of the fact before God next time for some illumination because you're so silent nobody knows you're around. We put you next to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or a Christian scientist or anybody else. Who would know the difference between you and them? Nobody. Unless you opened your mouth and talked. You'd be surprised how many Christians there are that are scared to death of witnessing because people are going to get mad at them. That's an occupational hazard. I mean, you have to face up to that. My son visits some people who are Christians, and the man who is in the family believes Jesus is going to save everybody no matter what. So why bother going out witnessing? Why bother telling anybody about hell? There isn't any hell. Why bother about extending yourself? After all, God knows who's going to be saved. He's going to take care of all that. Why bother telling anyone? That's the great cop-out of the ages. What that person is really saying is, I'm inadequate and I can't do it. And what's more, I'm scared witless if I do. And so you keep quiet and the people around you don't even know there is a hell. The world knows there's a hell. It tells us to go there on a regular basis. Is that right? I don't know how long it's been since you've had the experience, but I get it on a rather regular basis. You would say, doesn't that upset you? No, it doesn't upset me at all. I rejoice because I know if somebody gets that mad at me, they're going to be thinking. And if they start thinking, it's possible the Spirit of God will breathe upon them and they'll get the message. And people curse you and get angry and swear and yell and everything. And uh, you just remain that nice, quiet, loving person. The Scripture says, a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. You give a soft answer, they get madder. Matter, matter, matter. Till finally, they get embarrassed by their anger. And then they'll say to you, well, I, I, naturally, you know, I, I don't mean this personal. Oh, you've been drawn and quartered and skewered, but it wasn't personal. <laughs> An amazing thing, the way the world operates, you know? 
Amazing. Yet God wants to teach us a lesson from all this. And the lesson is, for heaven's sake, stand up for the truth of Christ because there's a great day coming. Stand up because the mystery has been revealed to us. We will not all die. The mystery has been revealed. We shall all be changed. The mystery has been revealed. Corruption will be supplanted by incorruption. Mortality by immortality. Death itself will be swallowed up by eternal life. Behold, I show you a great mystery. Again, the sting of death is sin. Verse 56. The strength of sin, the law. But, oh, how I love that word in this passage. But, you look at it for a moment. The sting of death is sin. Anybody here not been stung? Don't be a hypocrite. The strength of sin, the law. Thou shalt not. But, thanks be to God, which has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory is ours, already held in reservation for us. No matter how rough the combat, no matter how great the personal discomfort, no matter how often the loss or how deep the wound, thanks be unto God who has given us already the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, these are your marching orders. Listen to them. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Number one, be steadfast. Number two, unmovable. Number three, abound. Because whatever you do, it is not in vain if it is done in the Lord. Thanks be unto God who has given to us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It has been swallowed up for us in life. And though we must suffer temporarily, the victory is already ours because the victory is the Lord's. Shall we pray? While we're quietly bowed in prayer, thinking upon what God has already done for us in the Lord Jesus, Let's be praying for the people here who may not have known that victory, whose lives have never been freed. Jesus, Master, through your Holy Spirit, move upon people who are here right now, people who need to know you as Savior. Open their hearts and the eyes and ears of their souls that they may hear your voice and be born again into your kingdom. Jesus, Master, breathe upon thy children who need encouragement and strength and building up Save them by thy mighty power that they may walk with thee and be fruitful. And Lord, upon those who are backslidden and need repentance and restoration, teach them that you are still the father of the prodigal son and that you meet those who come towards you more than halfway. In Jesus Christ's name, hear this prayer and be merciful. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with all of you who love Jesus Christ and his appearance in sincerity. In Jesus' name.